Hello, I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Life is changing in Australia and around the world. Those were the sobering words of the Prime Minister Scott Morrison this week as governments and institutions moved aggressively to slow the spread of COVID-19. The reason? The growing number of deaths attributed to the virus that's sowing fear and loathing into every layer of society. In Australia, the number of cases has risen dramatically in the past week. We've passed 870 positive tests and it's too early to tell whether the recently implemented isolation and social distancing measures are working. Every state and territory has been affected. New South Wales continues to have the most cases and has registered six of the seven deaths in Australia. The one other death has been in Victoria, where there are more than 170 cases. Queensland is the second most affected state, 184 cases there, and Western Australia has jumped to 64. And this is how we compare to the rest of the world. This is the amount of confirmed cases and it shows the trajectory that Australia is on. A lot of the government controls brought in are aimed at flattening that line to mimic the successful campaigns in South Korea and Japan. This line is what doctors are referring to when they call for more stringent public health measures. Italy now has more deaths than China, although as you can see on this graph, China still has more confirmed cases. Iran now has more than 18,000 cases. In that country, someone dies at a rate of one every 10 minutes and 50 Iranians are contracting coronavirus every hour. All overseas travel into Australia is being stopped as we join a growing list of countries shutting down their borders. That's prompted the government and industry to step up their efforts to stave off what many say would be an inevitable recession. The Prime Minister says that at this stage the government has planned for the next six months and that means the budget will be delayed until October. Earlier the Reserve Bank acted. Phil Lasker explains. Not only did the RBA cut the official interest rate without waiting for the usual monthly board meeting, it'll also buy government bonds, which has the effect of driving down interest rates for a whole range of loans, like fixed interest loans for businesses and homes. It's also released cheap funding for banks worth at least $90 billion, which is aimed at supporting business, particularly small and medium enterprises. Well, a stark reminder of the impact on small businesses is the empty streets of our towns and cities. Their chances of survival have been further cruelled by the strict social distancing measures. The government wants only 25 people to be allowed in a space of 100 square metres, so that's one person for every four square metres. I took a stroll around Sydney earlier today. In the nation's big metropolises, central business districts are experiencing anything but business as usual. The Pitt Street Mall at lunchtime would normally be heaving with people, locals, office workers, international visitors, day trippers. Today, the crowd numbers are far lower than what they would normally be, what you would normally expect at this time of the year, at this time of the day. Now that's critical for these businesses because a lot of them are paying rents based on high foot traffic numbers that will generate that sort of revenue. Now that foot traffic has simply evaporated. Most businesses can absorb that for a little period of time, but what happens in the future is going to be critical to the way business survives this downturn. This is one of the city's favourite tourist attractions, the Sydney Opera House. And the forecourt here is normally a really good barometer of what's happening in the tourism industry at any given time. Normally, at this time of day, late morning, early afternoon, it's absolutely packed with international visitors. And you can tell because of the sheer number of languages that you can hear when you walk through. Today, though, obviously, there's not a lot of people about. That's not to say it's dead. There are still people milling about, but they are practising that social distancing. Many people have correctly noted you can't have an economy without consumer confidence. Consumer confidence can be hard to come by when the entire health of the global population is facing a serious risk. 
So firm warnings are being issued to those panic buying and hoarding. Grocery shops are still being stripped of goods. Trading hours for seniors and the disabled haven't been the success they were hoped to be. That's because Coles and Woolworths have been unable to restock the shelves fully. Toilet paper, pasta and paracetamol are still proving very difficult to get. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison has chastised those who are panic buying. Stop hoarding. I can't be more blunt about it. Stop it. It's not sensible, it's not helpful, and I've got to say it's been one of the most disappointing things I've seen in Australian behaviour in response to this crisis. That is not who we are as a people. It is not necessary. It is not something that people should be doing. Um, there are, what it does is it is distracting uh, attention and efforts that need to be going into other measures to be focusing on how we maintain supply chains into these shopping centres. There is no reason for people to be hoarding supplies in fear of a lockdown or anything like this. As I've said, we are putting in place scalable and sustainable measures. First a city, then a country, then the world. With reports of deaths on most continents and no vaccine in sight, the questions remain. How far will the virus spread? How many lives will it take? Well, there were some ominous milestones passed this week with global cases exceeding 200,000 and the global death toll topping 10,000. Of the 245,000 global cases, more than 88,000 have already recovered. In Australia, there have been 877 positive tests. Seven elderly people have died. Well, there's a lot of information going around. Uh, our GP, Dr Brad Mackay, and the ABC's national medical reporter, Sophie Scott, joined us earlier. I put some of your questions to them. Virus off pets fur. Now, we get a lot of these questions about surfaces because it's almost as if once you've cleaned your hands, you've washed them, you know, 20, 30 seconds, it's all, you go to turn off the tap, you open the door, the bathroom door, you, you walk out, you kind of walk out of the house, you, you're constantly touching things, and there's this constant question we get. How long does the virus live for? Brad, are we getting any clarity on that yet? Um, not quite yet. There's not a hell of a lot of research on that. I take my dog for a walk around the neighbourhood and I'm a little bit edgy about anybody else uh, touching my dog's head. Um, so I, I think a lot of people will just sort of start to, to distance a little bit, which is what we're, we're advising people to do. But I think it will happen a little bit with pets. I think if, if somebody does come up and does scratch your dog's head, um, then I would probably not touch their head for a while. Uh, when you get home, um, give them a bit of a, a wash and a wipe down. Um, but yeah, you don't need to cover them in that alcohol. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just sort of like common sense. I think that the chance would be low. Uh, we know that you're much more likely to get it if you're in close personal contact with somebody else. Uh, we know that surfaces are a problem. Um, but yeah, it's just being careful. Um, there probably will be some transmission, but I, I think the likelihood is, is still relatively low. Samantha Bach uh, asks this question. I live with an elderly person who has lung disease. I work in a school and my daughter goes there as well. Should we not go to work or school as a precaution for our housemates, so as a precaution for this elderly person they live with? We use very high standards of hygiene, but what do you think? Any advice would be very helpful. That's from Samantha Bark on Facebook. Sophie? Well, I would have thought, um, given that's an older person with a lung condition, that would put them at particular risk. Um, it's, it's difficult to know because uh, it would be... If you, what's likely to happen is that if kids are going to school or an adult's going out, they could, def they could bring the virus back into that household. So probably practising some good social distancing, you know, the 1.5 metres uh, with that elderly person would make sense. I mean, there's no one in that household that has the virus, which is good, but probably just being a bit more careful because that, that elderly person is in a really high risk category. Brad, what do you think? Yeah, and I think the guidance for this is a little bit um, blurry, I suppose, at best. Um, so what we're what we're sort of thinking logically about this is that you would you would be able to intermingle with other people. Um, you could then bring the, the virus back home and then potentially infect your, your older um, household member. So the issue is that, uh, as we've been talking previously, is about 80% of people might have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. So you could certainly be harbouring it inside you and not be aware of it at all. So I, I think it's a little bit dangerous to go, oh yeah, everything's fine, I'm, I'm feeling well, nobody's got the virus, like you really don't know. Um, so I, I 
I would be advising, like I'm very biased because I'm a doctor, um, I would be advising those people to, um, if they're wanting to protect their household members, um, from being really, really careful about intermingling with other people. Someone writes to our website saying there's been no advice about personal services like barbers, hairdressers, manicurists and so on. I've been thinking ahead to my next haircut and thinking, do I just go the buzz cut and grow a beard out and just hope for the best? Well, Sophie, I'm just is glad it... I had my hair done <laughs> because I was thinking too, what am I going to do about going? I know that now the, um, for example, massage therapists have been told that they shouldn't be doing massages. That's been something that their, their peak body has been put has put out as a recommendation. But I guess I haven't seen anything official from like hairdresser organisations about what people should be doing. I would imagine that they would have to take precautions, like at least wear a mask, yeah. because you know that is close contact with someone for a prolonged period of time. Mm. So they, for their own safety, they need to be taking those precautions as well. Brad, you see a lot of businesses with signs at the front door saying, if you've been sick, if you've been in a foreign country that's at risk, you shouldn't be walking into these premises. That's one line of defence for these uh, personal services, isn't it? Yeah, so and we can't use our keep cups anymore. We have to use disposable cups now at our, at our, our cafe shops. So um, yeah, there's a lot of changes that are going on in businesses. And I, I think um, people, we're, we're still trying to have people um, participating in business. We're still wanting that economy to, to keep on running as best as we can. Um, I suppose down the track, we may actually say, look, just don't get out of your house. Um, over initially, they have had, um, like, just going to the supermarket or the pharmacy, and that's it. So people have been Googling online at how to cut my own damn hair. Um, and, I've been doing uh, that. Have you? Have yeah, you been doing cutting your own I hair have. or Googling? Been, the, both. both. <laughs> well, well, I haven't cut my own hair yet, but I, yeah. I am kind of daydreaming about the buzz cut to come because I'm not quite sure how... I'm, uh, how this is going to work. I mean, th there's but a significant degree of exposure for those people who are working. And, you know, it's a stream of income for them. It's a very big call to say... Don't do uh, it. Don't, don't do your massage. Don't exactly. do your haircuts. Yeah. So, uh, so one I've... thing I did want to flag, and I don't know if we've had any questions, is just about the impact of, of this virus on young people. Mm -hmm. I think there's been some good um, new data that's come out in the last week. It was um, data looking at patients from the United States, 2,500 people in the United States that had coronavirus. And I live in a household full of um, uni students and I was just wanting to flag with them this data showing that it was nearly 40% of people who were hospitalised in the US were aged between 20 and 54. So almost half were under the age of 55. James Stewart, who's just written in saying, does Dr Brad recommend we stop going to the gym? I have to be honest, from a mental health point of view, the gym is one of my favourite places to go. Is that just a really bad idea? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I hate to say it, but I, I think the, that gyms are a, a situation where people will use equipment, our fingers go and everything. We can wipe down the equipment beforehand and after we train. Um, I think that's a way of limiting uh, the, the viral spread. Uh, but we've seen overseas that gyms have been a great source of infection, um, particularly in China, sort of spreading, um, spreading the, the virus from person to person. And someone else asks, I understand self-isolation, but what about those of us who are practising social distancing? Can I go for a hike with one friend, four friends, ten friends? Brad, what does that look like? Yeah, I think one of the things to really mention is the seriousness of this. And I, I think there are many um, young people who are in their 20s uh, or younger who are just like, oh, well, this isn't going to affect me. This isn't a problem. And uh, if we have that attitude, this is really going to get out of hand very quickly. So I, I think if you are going for exercising, uh, if, you're, if you're exercising with other household members, I think they'll be OK. If you did happen to go for a run with somebody like a friend who's down the road, um, trying to keep that, that physical distance of at least 1.5 metres as you are exercising. Um, if you're crossing past somebody on the pavement, we are needing to, to divert and, and to go with a wide berth from other people. And the whole thing is that, um, yeah, as, as Sophie said, you may get sick, you may you may not die, but you could be in intensive care for, for weeks. Um, so this is a problem. Um, and you could certainly um, transmit the virus to somebody else in the household and they could die or get into hospital as well. So we, we, we need to be stopping having parties. We need to stop meeting up in, in cafes and restaurants as much as we can. Um, and we're needing to take this very seriously. Dr Brad Mackay there, and if you want to hear more answers, you can check out our full 40-minute chat on the ABC News YouTube channel and on Facebook as well. Thanks for joining us. Keep sending us your questions. We'll be back next week. From all of us, bye for now.